We've been discerning some different things on God's calendar, um, and we have recently come to understanding, been given wisdom regarding God's months and how his months and days and years are set in reference to the moon. So we've discerned days. We know that there are 30 days in God's month and 360 days in his year. We recently discovered that God's days and months and years are not a continuous stream of consecutive seven-day weeks, but actually that within a month, the new moon is going to restart everything. There's a seven-day cycle. There are four sets of seven days, which means that every 8th, 15th, 22nd, and 29th are going to be seven-day Sabbaths. Every new moon, which is, of course, on the 1st, is also going to be a day of rest, a Sabbath, but it's not a seven-day Sabbath. We have seen confirmed within Scripture, within the feast days, that even when God is disrupting this pattern, such as with the Day of Atonement, which is on the 10th, you would have the 8th as a rest day, the 9th as a work day, the 10th as a rest day on the Day of Atonement, and then you'd have uh, 11, 12, 13, 14 work days, and then the 15th, even though it the Day of Atonement has disrupted that seven-day or the six-day work days in order to make that a week, God commanded that the first day of the Festival of Tabernacles begin on that 15th day and that it be a Sabbath. And he did this in order to not disrupt the six days of work and seventh day of rest Sabbaths. This way we could get right back on track to there being a Sabbath on the 8th, the 15th, the 22nd, and the 29th. And then we have those two two days that are between those four weeks, which are the 30th day of the month, which is a work day, and the first day of, a mo- of the month, which is a new moon, a rest day. Now, the new moon is not always called a full day. So in the Bible, it'll reference it as the day of new moon. And there's this peculiar language or concept that God establishes in Genesis in which he says, and then there was evening and there was morning the first day. So he's defined evening and morning to be the first day. But between evening and morning and then the next evening and morning, there's actually daytime. So what do we do with that? Well, there are certain cases when the new moon rises in which the new moon w- might rise in the evening, then then you're good, evening to morning, the first day. But what if the new moon resets in the morning, which is actually sometimes what it does? Well, science has taken it upon themselves to just call that a 29-day month or a 30-day month. And so they'll take half a day from new moon to new moon is irrefutably. 29.5 days. I calculated it for an entire year. I'm sure that it's the same pattern every single year. 29.5 days from new moon to new moon. What do you do with that half a day? Do you spread it out in between so that there's 23.6 hours in a day? Well, I tried that theory. It didn't really work because eventually you're going to end up with sunlight during the night. But what I did realize is that from and and really not me so much as what God was leading me to because he kept telling me the moon is the faithful witness in the sky the moon is the faithful witness in the sky that's what he says in his word okay so if the new moon, if the new moon is marking the the crescent moon by the way not new moon as science defines it the new moon in the bible is the crescent moon so if that is what defines the beginning of the month and that restarts everything then if you have a day that is from evening to morning and then you have a new moon that comes up in the morning and the rooster crows and, and, and lets you know the new moon is here, then from that morning until just before evening when the next day starts, that is new moon. That is the day of new moon. And so during that time, during that what we would call a day, that 24-hour period, you could have three days that have just passed. Yes, that is weird, but it's what God established. And it's only weird because we adapted to foreigners, we adapted to what the world says, and now what God has established is weird to us. We need to get our butts back into gear so that what the world does is weird to us. So yes, on that particular 24-hour period, which God didn't establish a 24-hour day, 
But that particular 24-hour period that we are used to would contain three days. It would contain an evening and a morning that was one day, a day from that morning until evening, one it's day two, and then from that evening until the next morning, day three. Now, new moon is you are to rest on new moon. The second day of the new moon festival is a work day. So on in this particular situation, you would have from morning, let's say that new moon came up at 9.30 a.m., what we call 9.30 a.m. That your day would begin at 9.30 a.m. until evening or just before evening. That's going to be the first new moon festival. And then the next new moon festival starts that evening until the next day, until the next just before evening. Why just before evening? Because nothing has interrupted it to restart it. We don't have another new moon interrupting it. So those would be your new moon festivals. First day being a day of rest, the second day being a work day. And then that's going to begin your next count to the work days. So the second of the, the first of the month is when that new moon just came up that morning until evening. Second day of the month is going to be that evening until just before the next evening. That is the second day of the month. But it's also the first day of your work week. So from the second until the seventh is going to, those are going to be work week, work days. And then on the eighth, you're going to have a Sabbath. Then from the ninth until the 14th, work days. The 15th, you've got a Sabbath, okay, and so on. So 8th, 15th, 22nd, and 29th are rest days. This means that every month you're going to have Sabbath on a different day, and it does make it very difficult. There are also some nice things about it. We haven't been to a farmer's market on a Saturday for a very, very long time. So my daughter and her husband were able to go to a farmer's market. They were kind of excited about that because we had been observing a Saturday Sabbath. Well, Saturday was implemented by the Romans. It was not implemented by God. And once we find out that what we've been doing is wrong, we correct it. And there's no turning back, is there? If you love him, there's no turning back. Now you can go and do some Saturday things. The hard part is going to be trying to explain this one to your employer. I need to take four days off. Well, actually, technically five days and holy days during holy day season. That's going to be difficult. It's going to be a challenge, but... God, if God has commanded something, he's going to make a way. In this video, we're going to talk about the year because we have to reconcile the 360-day year. The one thing that I want to tell you before we talk about the 360-day year is I want to draw your attention to the fact that during this kind of a month, a 29.5-day month, you're going to have 354 24-hour days, but God calls these 360 days because remember that we took that one day in that example that I gave you, you've got three days within a 24-hour period being represented. Not the entirety of those days, right? I mean, you've got morning to evening the first day, then you have morning to the next evening, which technically represents that 24-hour period, and then you have another day starting. But in what we're calling a day here in the world from sun sunrise to sundown, now you've got three days being represented. You see how the Antichrist set this up and it's just so in opposition to what God established that it just makes it so troublesome and difficult for us to get back to. But we're going to do it. So being that this is the case, that you have days that are being the sequence of what is called a day being sort of quote unquote interrupted. Obviously, it's not a, an interruption or a problem for God. But in our concept of what a day is, we are needing to understand that there is an interruption that's taking place. It's not this consecutive pattern, just like a month is not a consecutive set of seven days. You've got four sets of seven days. You have one day, then four sets of seven days, then another day, and then that's your month. Then it starts over again, first day of rest, four sets of seven days weeks, then the 30th is a work day. So what this comes out to in terms of what we've been measuring measuring is 354 days, but it comes out to 360 God days. So yes, this is going to make calculating a little bit more cumbersome, but I'm here to help. 
Okay, so we have to reconcile what's going on in this 354-day calendar because really it was already going to be challenging if we were to calculate a 360-day, 24-hour day calendar. That was already going to set us back with the seasons. But now we have this 11-day discrepancy between this 365 um, days seasonal calendar. Uh, and if God's feast days have to be set in reference to a season, this is going to be really difficult to try to reconcile. So in a previous video, I had mentioned that in Levit Leviticus 23, when talking about the festival of tabernacles, that God says to collect branches from luxuriant trees, from willows and palms and this sort of thing. Well, if you are, if, if on a 354 day calendar, according to what the world is calling 300 and a, a day, a 24 hour day. So if on 354 day calendar, you're going to end up in all of the seasons on the festival of tabernacles. And this is going to be quite difficult because a willow is a deciduous tree. Trees are not luxuriant in the wintertime unless you have maybe evergreens or something like that. But I don't know that you'd necessarily call it luxuriant. And I don't necessarily know that you would want to go out there and sleep in the cold in a, in a temporary shelter. All right. Well, in Leviticus 23, it talks about this is a command for the Israelites, for native-born Israelites specifically. Native-born Israelites. The word doesn't say that very often in the Bible. And so, in fact, this is the only place where I know that it actually says it. Native-born Israelites means this was specifically a command for them. Uh, what it does not mean is that the festival of tabernacles is not to be observed by us. We most definitely need to observe this. What it does mean is that all native-born Israelites were to live in temporary shelters. So during that time, the native-born Israelites would have been doing that, and the seasons would have lined up. In the subsequent chapters, when talking about the festival of tabernacles, there is not a command, first of all, for Gentiles to do this or non-native born Israelites to, to be collecting branches from luxuriant trees and living in temporary shelters. And the other issue is that it says in Leviticus 23, when you enter the land. So it's really giving a lot of context to what it's commanding here in Leviticus 23. Again, we still observe every single one of God's festivals. There is not a single festival that has been abolished if they've been fulfilled. And by the way, Festival of Tabernacles, when it was commanded, had already been fulfilled. So no one should say that fulfillment means abolishment, especially when Jesus said, I haven't come here to abolish, but to fulfill. He must have been meaning something else other than abolish. So we are to observe all of his feast days. And in fact, we'll be observing him after this age. All right. So what does this mean? The, the reason why I'm talking about this is because that was a sticking point for me. Once I saw that about the luxuriant trees, I was like, huh, well, how can you have luxuriant trees in winter, particularly with these deciduous trees? So there's the explanation for that. Now, there are certain seasons in which God chose to begin his festivals. For example, Passover occurred during a specific season. We know that because the first Passover, he said, take a lamb a year old. And so, and I believe that he was being literal in that context. There are other contexts. I had this discussion with someone recently and I need to go correct myself with him because um, he had said, well, a year old could also be like a year and a month. So, you know, April could still be the thing. And he's actually correct about that because we know that where, you know, there's a context in, Bible, in the word where I think in numbers where God says, take seven male lambs a year old and sacrifice them during the festival of weeks. And obviously that would not have been during the festival, that would not have been during the birthing season of lambs. But in this particular situation, I believe God was being literal. And the reason I believe that is because our ultimate, the, the, the significance of a lamb during Passover is huge. God is referred to, or Jesus is referred to as the lamb of God. And so it makes perfect sense that God would 
set his first Passover in reference to the birthing season of lambs and that he would be literal about this. And as it is, as we go back to calculate and we see when these things were taking place, we can see that it actually was occurring during that time. I'm going to show you. As we go on, I'm going to show you and I'll point it out to you. Now in John 10, 22 through 30, it says, Then came the festival of dedication in Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. Okay, so here we have the festival of dedication. We know that that occurs in the ninth month on the 25th day. This is in the book of the Maccabees, by the way. And it being winter in Israel would have to be at the end of October, early November through March. So the following year when Jesus was crucified and this lined up in reference to Pentecost in the first uh, first chapter of Acts, we know that, that this was, that this lined up in reference to Pentecost. So we know that it occurred during, again, during the birthing season of lambs in March, early March or, or February. So let's set this in reference to March. Now, if we have these new moon to new moon months and the month of Aviv, when Jesus was sacrificed, was lined up with, let's say, early March. Then the previous year, during that winter and the festival of dedication, that would have lined up with early November. Okay, so that checks out. So we have the first path, Passover, which occurred during the birthing season of lambs. We have the next Passover 40 years later to the day in Joshua 4, you see the month, which is the 10th day of the month. Now, what was happening, if you know your you know your Bible, Exodus 12, Moses was commanded on the 10th day of the month to take the lamb into the home, keep it for four days, care for it for four days, and then on the 14th day of the month to slaughter the lamb at, mid, at uh, twilight, excuse me. And so you see that Joshua is bringing, his, bringing the people into the promised land on the 10th day of the month. And Leviticus 23 tells us when you enter the land I'm going to give you and you reap its harvest, you are not allowed to eat any of the roasted grain, no bread, until you have brought your offering to the Lord. This is in reference to the barley. We know that because offering of first fruits is reference re, in reference to barley, which is harvested 50 days before the wheat is going to be harvested. Barley is harvested in March. So we know that during this time, that this was again during that same period of the birthing season of the lambs. It actually that year lined up with the barley season and the offering of first fruits. And then 50 days later, in about mid May, you'd be harvesting that wheat. They could not have been eating roasted grain, they could not have been eating bread unless they had participated in that offering of first fruits for the bar of the barley harvest. So we know that this is set in reference to Passover. Now let me show you something kind of interesting. 40 years to the day, to the day. So if you take 40 and you multiply it by 354 because we want to get the date, the the days. Now this I told you it was going to be cumbersome to try to understand like well how do we how do we take a 365 day year and try to like translate that? I'm going to show you right now. You're going to take those 40 days, 40, excuse me, not, I keep saying 40 days, 40 years, and you're going to multiply them by 354 so that you can get the exact number of days that God was talking about. When he says 40 years, he's not basing that on a 365 day calendar. He's basing it on his calendar. And so we know that his 360 day calendar is equivalent to the 354 day calendar. Uh, day calendar that that we would use in a lunar month based on a 24-hour day. Okay, so we're going to multiply this by 354 in order to get the number of days that would be in God's, uh, uh, that, that would have passed in 40 years. And then we're going to take that number of days and divide it by 365 so that we can understand, okay, what would be the equivalent number of years in what we've been defining to be a day. And the number that you come to is 38.79. So in roughly 39 years, we would have traveled through the full year so that in the 40th year, we would end up right back in the same season. Is that incredible or what? So again, 
40 years times 354, you're going to get the number of days. You're going to divide that by 365 so that you can get the number of years. And then you're going to round up to about, you know, because it's roughly 39 years. And every 40 years, you'll, you'll end up back in the same season. Okay, so we've established that the very first Passover, he made that line up with the birthing season of the lambs. We know that. I just proved it to you. Because we're certain that when Joshua brought the Israelites into the promised land, that that definitely was during the birthing season of the lambs, was definitely because we know when the barley season is. And that 40 years prior to that would have been exactly that same season. We know that the Passover in which Jesus uh, sacrificed and extended the covenant, that that correlated to the birthing season of the lambs because it was 50 days before Pentecost. So it was during the barley harvest, birthing season of the lambs. So as God is reestablishing, restoring his calendar right now, I demonstrated to you in previous videos that the day that I told you that God anointed me and I, I did not understand why is this on a Wednesday, I know you're going you're gonna to explain this to me, there's an explanation. Um, I, I demonstrated to you based on what I have, am, have learned a year over a year and a half later, this is why it was a Wednesday. It was actually the day after the Sabbath because God didn't have Sunday through Monday in the Bible. Okay, so now we've established that. And I, I just want to make sure that you guys understand that because when God's restoring things, he, it, it is in line with his pattern and his heart to do something like this, to make sure that in this year, when he's restoring these things, well, technically not this year, that was the year 2022. Um, but in this year, as he's revealing this information, that he would have lined it up and made it very clear to us um, uh, that that he has lined this up with the birthing season, you know, the, the original times that he had set up and the original way that he had correlated that to the seasons. But that does not mean that we still have that correlation with the seasons. So we need to take a look at that. If this is true, and, and, and you know, on a 354-day calendar, like I said, you can't have the seasons line up with the months. It's just not going to happen unless I'm missing some. But mathematically, I've plotted it out and it, it, it just doesn't work. So we have to go to the Bible and we have to look and see, okay, are there any other situations in which this did not line up? And actually there are. Acts 27, 9. Much time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous by now. It was after the Day of Atonement. So Paul warned them, then I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in. Now, what does it mean to winter in? It means that you're waiting for the winter to pass. You found someone somewhere to kind of nest until winter passes. So since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in Crete facing both fa southwest and northwest. Okay, so it's the day after atonement. They're trying to winter in a particular place. Now, there's two options here. One is that he has gone to Greece in order to winter in Greece because that's where Crete is. So he's gone there to winter because winter has started in Israel. Okay, that's possible because in Crete, fall actually begins in the month of October, while wintering is, excuse me, winter is beginning in Israel in that month. But in a, so in a year where Passover occurred during March, the Day of Atonement would end up being in August or September. And that's not quite winter in either of, the, either of these places. So one would be that you're wintering, um, you know, you're trying to winter in Crete during the winter in Crete, or you're trying to winter in Crete during the winter in Israel. But being that if in that year, the Passover had occurred in March. The Day of Atonement would have been in August and September, and that's not the winter in either Greece or in Israel. So this had to have occurred in a time when the seasons were not correlating with the feast days, with the date-specific feast days. Now, there's a difference between these feast days. So you have a season-specific, two season-specific feast days, which are the 
the offering of first fruits and the feast of weeks. Those have to occur during the barley harvest and the wheat harvest. Barley for offering of first fruits, wheat harvest for Pentecost or the festival of weeks. Every other holy day occurs on a date specific designation. So you have date specific and you have season specific, harvest specific. The Day of Atonement is not a season or harvest specific. It is a date specific. It is the 10th day of the seventh month. And during a year where Passover would have occurred during that birthing season of the lambs, the the uh, the timelines that God established during the Exodus, when Jesus came, when Joshua brought the people in, in the year 2022, when he was beginning to reveal this calendar, it could not have been winter. Another context in scripture is in First Chronicles 20, verse 1, in which it says, in the spring, at the time when the kings go off to war. So one of the greatest days, I mean, what, I mean one of the days that, uh, or most significant days that God talks about in the Bible with regard to war is the day that Nebuchadnezzar or Babylon laid siege to Jerusalem. This was when the land was taken from uh, from the Jews because they had disobeyed and they had gone off to serve other gods. And um, and so now their land was going to be taken from them. And God mentions this date in three different books in, uh, I believe it's Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Second Kings. Don't quote me on that, but I think those are the, the different contexts. Anyways, the, the date, and he says, write down this date, document this date, because this is the date when Babylon is going to lay siege to Jerusalem. So how does that fit with the word, the 10th day of the 10th month? This would have to be occurring in spring. It couldn't be occurring in winter. You know, for example, earlier we read about the festival of dedication being in the ninth month. We know that that's in the ninth month and that Jesus was walking in Solomon's colonnade. Would uh, Babylon lay siege to Jerusalem in the, in the dead of winter? Not according to the Bible. Spring is when the kings go off to war. And I think it goes without saying that, you know, Jeremiah is, he's confined to the courtyard. Is he confined to the courtyard, like in the rain, in the snow? I mean, there's no mention of that. Not even in an inclination. I would think that that would even be mentioned, right? In the, in the middle of winter. And then you see in Jeremiah 52 that Nebuzaradan, once um, the king of Babylon has broken through Jerusalem, that Nebuzaradan left behind the rest of the poorest people of the land to work the vineyards and the fields. So this is definitely not during winter because you don't work the fields during winter. Okay, so in terms of years, it does appear that there are date-specific holy days, there are season-specific holy days, that God has set up his Passover in a particular way the very first month he set it up in a very particular way and he made sure that it lined up when in you know 40 years later that it lined up during the same season that it lined up during the same season when when Jesus was here and that it's lined up in the very same season as he has taken away his holy days his sabbaths and new moons but is now restoring them he has lined this up so that it is in reference to the Passover um, and that original season that he had established. It does not mean that it's going to be that way forever. I have plotted out roughly what we would understand the uh, new moons to be. Of course, we have to make sure that we're checking this, but it should be it should be accurate within a couple of days. Really, not even a couple of days, but within about one day. Because we know that the new moon is going to occur every 29.5 days. But what I've done is taken this from the internet. So the reason I say that there might be a day off is because this is a prediction of when those new moons are going to occur. And so being that this is a prediction, and and really it's a prediction from the Islamic calendar because they are the only ones who are actually looking according to the crescent moon. And to be honest, I have literally no patience for anyone who's going to say, oh, you shouldn't be doing anything according to Islam. I'm not doing anything according to Islam. Islam is doing a better job of tracking God's calendar than people calling themselves Christian who chase after science and the Romans. So before anyone wants to come on here saying that nonsense, 
You better go look at the plank in your own eye. I really don't care about the high horse you think you're riding on. What counterfeit Christianity is doing is basing their religion on what Rome has established. And then they get all high and mighty about don't do anything that Islam does. They're doing a better job than you are. They're slaughtering the animals correctly. They're not adding things like put the animals, you know, put the meat in salt water. They're draining the blood. They're doing all of that. Yes, I shop at a halal market. If you're so dumb that you think that I'm paying homage to a false god because I go to a halal market and I look at an Islam calendar, you probably don't belong on this channel because you have not been given understanding. The word Allah is God in Arabic. Even Jews admit that they are worshiping the same God. Just because people are misinformed does not make you better. You got to take a look at what we've been doing in counterfeit Christianity. Because as far as I can see, these people have been at least observing what they think is right. And they're observing it better than those who've been given truth. I will go shop in a halal market before I'll shop in a kosher market. Because one adds to the scroll and doesn't believe in Jesus the other is doing exactly what God commanded in terms of sacrificing, in, in terms of slaughtering those animals. And they do believe in Jesus. And when Jesus was speaking with the Samaritan woman at the well, she was, or Samaritans were, to Jews like Islam is to Jews right now. They did not associate. So why was Jesus associating with her? Why is it that she believed that the Messiah was coming? Do you realize that Islam believes that Jesus is the Messiah and Jews don't? If you can't hear the things I'm saying right now, it's because you haven't been given ears to hear it. Don't act like an ethnic category is better than another. And then accuse those of us who don't go along with this satanic narrative that an ethnic category can do whatever the heck they want because a land they're entitled to some land because you don't know the Bible. No one inherits that land until the resurrection. And it's not an ethnic group that's going to inherit the land. It is those who are identified as Jews who are circumcised in heart. Not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Not all who are descended from Abraham are Abraham's children. So based on that lunar calendar, this is what's going to happen. From 2024, the first month, Aviv will begin on February 12th. Next year, it's going to begin, or, or a, a day, give or take a day. Next year, January 31st. The following year, January 20th. The following year, January 9th. Then December 29th. December 17th. And by 2030, it'll be, it, the first month on God's calendar will begin on December 7th. So that means that we would be observing Passover in 2030, somewhere around December uh, 21st. This year, we'll be observing Passover somewhere around February 26th. So you see what I'm saying? He's lined this up, and, and it you know just so happens that this was true in 20, uh, 2022 as well. He's lined this up to be during the birthing season of the lamb. And next year, it will still be during the birthing season of the lamb. The following year, close, close to it. But by 2030, you're observing it maybe half a month before. So you can see that on the 354-day calendar or 360 God days, that this would be occurring earlier and earlier on the seasonal calendar. And as we calculated a little while ago, in 40 years, it's going to reset again back onto that seasonal calendar. The two festivals that are going to remain season specific are what? Offering of first fruits, which is going to be during always during barley harvest, somewhere around March, and festival of weeks, always going to be somewhere around May, somewhere in May. So we're going to have to figure, we're going to have to discern that. How do we observe this? When, when is that um, harvest season? It shouldn't be very difficult. I don't think that's going to be very difficult to discern. But the year, month, day, Sabbaths, the, these were doozies. Please discern this message with God. If you have questions, ask questions. Discern this with me. 
test what I'm presenting to you. I don't mind being tested. In fact, I prefer it because I want to test what it is that I am discerning as well and make sure that this is accurate. The only thing that matters is truth. So please discern this with God.